the floor is yours, Elsa. Well, hello and thank you, Filippo, for the invitation again. And well, thanks, thanks for being here. I also want to start with, start with uh, another thanks uh, to my collaborator, Clement Canon, who's not here from Paris Circam, but we, may, uh, we, we conducted a study I, I want to be present, uh, presenting today together soon to him. Yeah, and uh, today I present an empirical study on aesthetic value and judgments uh, of the identity of artworks. And this study can be situated in the literature on people's judgments of the persistence of various subjects over time. And as we know from previous research, our identity judgments are shaped by normative considerations. Uh, it has been found that we believe people to be essentially morally good. And uh, ordinary intuitions suggest that moral improvement uh, tend to lead to the continuity of identity of a person while moral deterioration on the contrary leads to the disruption of identity. So the main question discussed in my talk will be, does this effect extend to aesthetic value and judgment on works of art? And I will begin with uh, a short overview. So we will start with a discussion on the literature on moral change and judgments on pers of personal identity. We will then continue with an overview of a paper which discusses to which extent the effect of change in value uh, on judgments of identity extend to other types of entities, such as institutional objects and artifacts. And later I will talk about the motivation for the current study on the effect of aesthetic value uh, on judgments uh, of the identity of artworks. And then we will discuss the results of the empirical study, which is central to my today's talk. And lastly, we will discuss the possible interpretations of the results, and I will present the plan of three follow-up studies. And I hope to hear your thoughts and suggestions for future studies and in the second part of today's meeting in the discussion. So many of you might be familiar with Phineas Gage's story. The famous accident happened in 1848. So Phineas Gage was a 25 year old railroad worker and he was blowing up rocks to clear the way for a new rail line. Unfortunately, because of an explosion, a metal bar he was using went in under his left cheekbone and out through the top of his head most of the front part of the left side of his brain was destroyed. Phineas didn't die, he was successfully treated and he returned home 10 weeks later. But some, works after, so some months after the accident, Phineas uh, felt good enough and wanted to resume work. But his personality after the accident had changed so much, the employers would not give him his place again. Before the accident, he had been described as very capable and efficient, with a well-balanced mind. After the accident, he was disrespectful and profane, showing little care for other work as impatient, unable to settle on any plans. So after the brain injury, he changed so much and he was so cruel that his friends said he was no longer Gage. This story has inspired not only researchers in neuroscience, but also many philosophers working on personal identity. So in addition to other aspects important for judgments of identity, such as physical continuity or memory, moral qualities of people are also considered crucial by philosophers. Well, for example, John Searle wrote that in cases where we feel that a person's personality has altered dramatically and drastically, we are inclined to feel he is not the same person anymore. To take a famous case, when an iron bar went through the skull of the 19th century railway worker, Phineas Gage, he miraculously survived, but his personality was totally different. From a purely practical point of view, we would continue to regard him as the same person. For example, he would still owe the taxes of Phineas Gage and still own the property of Phineas Gage. But from a neurobiological point of view and a philosophical point of view, we want to know very much what had changed if Aeneas Gage so as to render him a totally different personality from what he had been before. 
In the last two decades, experimental philosophers uh, conducted a large number of empirical studies to investigate our intuitions on the importance of moral change for personal identity. And study participants are usually presented with stories about a person who undergoes various changes and either loses or gains properties she did or didn't have before. So the story of Phineas Gage has been used in these studies. To better imagine how this actually looks like, uh, let us consider an example. So here is the vignette use in Kevin Tobias' study on personal identity. Phineas is extremely kind or cruel, depends on, on the condition. He really enjoys helping or harming people. He's also employed as a railroad worker. One day at work, a railroad explosion causes a large iron spike to fly out and into his head, and he's immediately taken for emergency surgery. The doctors manage to remove the iron spike and their patient is fortunate to survive. However, in some ways, this man after the accident is remarkably different from Phineas before the accident. Phineas before the accident was extremely kind or cruel and enjoyed helping or harming people. But the man after the accident is now extremely cruel or kind, the opposite. He even enjoys uh, harming or helping people. And later study participants are usually presented with a, a short story describing a disagreement between two friends on what has happened here. So for example, in this study, the participants read about Art and Bart who disagree over what happened in the story. Art thinks that Phineas before the accident and the man after the accident are different from in some aspects, but are still the same person. To Art, it seems like one person Phineas experienced some changes, but disagrees. He thinks that after the accident, the original man named Phineas does not exist anymore. The man after the accident is a different person. To Bart, it seems like one person died, Phineas before the accident. And it is really a different person entirely that exists after the accident, the man after the accident. Another female story used in these studies is Derek Parfit's uh, Russian nobleman thought experiment. So in several years, a young Russian will inherit vast estates. Before he has into socialist ideals, he intends now to not give the land to the peasants, but he knows that in time his ideals may fade. To guard against this possibility, he does two things. He first signs a legal document, uh, which will automatically not give away the land and which can be revoked only with his wife's consent. He then says to his wife, promise me that if I ever change my mind and ask you to revoke this document, you will not consent. He adds, I regard my ideals as essential to me. If I lose these ideals, I want you to think that I cease to exist. I want you to regard your husband then, not as me, the man who asked you for this promise, but only as his corrupted later self. Promise he that you will not do what he asks. So with the, if the wife made his promise and if she was asked later to revoke the document, she might feel as she has obligations to two different people, the former young Russian nobleman and the current old Russian nobleman. So the results of studies on the direction of moral change and personal identity have repeatedly shown that the direction of change is relevant to judgments on personal identity. Morally improved Russian nobleman can release his wife from her past promise while morally deteriorated uh, Russian nobleman can't. Why is that so? Many studies on ordinary intuitions uh, about personal identities suggest that people tend to believe that moral traits uh, are the most essential part of identity. For example, in one study, participants read a story about a man who loses different parts of his mind. Uh, inability, so he, he's, uh, he's unable now to recognize objects, he loses autobiographical memories, he loses desires, or he loses moral conscience. A person with a moral deficit is considered more significantly changed than one who loses memories, desires, or perceptual capacities. And when a person loses moral properties, uh, it's no longer considered as the same person. Uh, people are held to be essentially good, is also supported by studies on the true self. And these studies, uh, participants read stories about an individual undergoing a change in behavior or beliefs. And in some scenarios, the behavior changes from morally bad to morally good, while in the others, uh, the opposite from morally good behavior to morally bad behavior. 
So for example, participants read a story about a man named Omar who either starts to treat ethnic minorities with respect or starts to mistreat ethnic, uh, mistreat ethnic minorities. And then they are asked to answer which part of this person is responsible for the change, uh, his true self or the so-called his surface self. And it turns out that people are more likely to associate positive moral changes with the true self and negative moral changes with the surface self, that is a peripheral socially conditioned part of the person. And research on psychological essentialism shows that people tend to represent uh, various sorts of terms, not in their observable properties, but in terms of a deeper essence that is not observed. Psychological essentialism pertains to natural kind terms, such as tiger or water, also to social categories such as race, gender, sexual orientation or religion, and individual entities and, well, persons. So I will not uh, discuss the possible cognitive mechanisms now in this talk, but for an overview of course, see this paper by George Newman and Joshua Nobby. However, this raises a question, does the FINEAS gauge effect pertain only to individual human beings or does it, does it extend to other kinds of entities? And this brings me to the second topic, the second part of the talk, which is institutional objects and artifacts. So while we believe that people are essentially good, probably because it's useful, it might encourage pro-social behaviors. Uh, we don't have to cooperate with many other types of objects, uh, such as artifacts. So it is unclear whether the belief about essence being good extends to other types of objects. It might arise only for judgments about human beings. So the free test, Toby and Newman and Nobby conducted a study to explore this question. Are positive traits essential in the case of other entities? And their study confirmed that removing uh, good properties of various kinds of objects are more disruptive to the identity than removing bad properties. There is an example of one uh, being yet used in the study. So Medline is an annual conference where professors get together to present the research. When the conference first began operating, the majority of its presentations were intentionally very commercial and not seriously aimed at addressing current medical problems, while some other presentations were intentionally very helpful and relevant to current medical problems. Over the years, some professors stopped attending the conference and some new professors started attending. Now, after these changes, the majority of its presentations are intentionally very helpful and relevant to current medical problems. So other vignettes in this study include objects such as country, rock band, science paper, and university. And the results suggest that previous findings that positive moral traits are held to be deepest aspects of person, persons ex extend to judgments about other types of entities such as group agents and institutions. But these authors raise a question of how general is this intuition? So does, does this intuition apply to all kinds of entities or is it limited only to certain kinds of them? For example, if we looked at judgments on artifacts such as cars, chairs, or houses, or biological kinds, animals, plants, or physical objects such as rocks, would we find the same effect that people would be more inclined to say that these entities persist in the improvement condition rather than in the deterioration condition. So these authors raise a hypothesis that normative effects uh, are more likely to, to be observed in cases where people believe that an object uh, has some sort of purpose. So if the purpose of bands is to make good music, the purpose of science papers is to make valuable scientific uh, contributions, and the purpose of human beings is to be morally good, then the effect of value is more likely to be observed. So let us now turn to the third part, uh, third part of the talk. Does the effect extend to works of art and changes in aesthetic value? So while humans are considered by default to be essentially morally good, it is currently unknown whether the aesthetic value has a similar effect. If we look for entities that could be uh, considered essentially aesthetically valuable, 
The most obvious candidate is artworks because they seem to be created to provide us with aesthetic experiences. And here is the main prediction of our study. We predict that works of art will be analogously seen as essentially aesthetically valuable, as persons are essentially morally valuable. The positive changes in aesthetic value will be associated with higher ratings of continuity of identity than negative changes in aesthetic value. So in our study, we manipulated three factors. Uh, first is aesthetic change type, whether the artwork is aesthetically more or less valuable afterwards, after the change. Uh, second, uh, artwork type, it's either a painting or a musical work. And the third uh, factor is source of the change. Either it is brought about by the creator, by the original creator, or happening independently of their will, depending on circumstances somewhere in the external world. So uh, I guess that hopefully our motivation for manipulating the first factor, that is the direction of aesthetic change, uh, should now be clear. So let me uh, briefly discuss the other two factors. First type of work, musical work or painting. So musical works and paintings are seen, at least in the ontological literature, as exhibiting different ontological behaviors. Paintings are standardly seen as concrete material objects, while musical works are more often than not considered to be abstract. So we are all probably familiar with the famous dis distinction by Nelson Goodman between allographic and autographic works. And musical works are held to be with allographic artworks, that is, artworks which do not allow for forgery, as opposed to autographic works, where the distinction between original and, and forgery is significant. So musical works are seen as essentially repeatable, multiply instantiable, like other works for performance. And paintings, on the other hand, are unique, and they are usually seen as uh, physical objects. So it is likely that we will allow more significant changes in musical works, and they will not be seen as destroying identity. And this is also suggested by the results of our 2020 study I, I conducted with my colleague Vilnius, Vilnius Dransika on the individuation of musical works. And in this study, we found that even quite significant acoustic uh, differences, for example, a change in instrument or other changes uh, that are significant enough for expressive and, and uh, representational properties to change, uh, they are not seen as enough to be constraining repeatability. And source of the change. So our intuition might depend on whether the change is made by the work's original author or not. And uh, this, this, this factor is motivated by David Friedel. He has raised a hypothesis that our social practices allow musical works uh, to be changed only by their original creators. So if, if this hypothesis is correct, then it might be that um, participants will see continuity of the author as the um, necessary condition for work identity. And in that case, they will see changes happening to the artwork outside of creators will as more destructive to works identity. So we created uh, vignettes describing either a, a painting or a musical work being changed either intentionally by the original artist or, or by circumstances uh, that are independent from their will. And the work after change is either more or less aesthetically valuable. So let us look at an example, uh, which is in French, but uh, because we ran the original study in French with, uh, with French participants, but I will read uh, a full translation. Yeah, so this vignette tells about a painting uh, changed by circumstances independent from creator's will and resulting in higher aesthetic value. Yeah, so imagine that a contemporary painter creates a new painting, Echo. The painting is regularly shown to the public during exhibitions, and this becomes quite well known, especially for its very particular colors. 
Some time after the death of the painter, a gas leak occurs in the room of the museum where the painting hangs. The gas leak causes a chemical reaction that completely changes the colors of the painting. Next day, the director of the museum finds out what happened and decides to leave the painting on display. Everyone agrees that the picture after the gas leak is much more beautiful. Each time the painting is exhibited in a museum, it is a public success. Then, as usually, study participants had to read a story about two friends who disagree about what happened. So one evening, two art lovers meet to discuss the painting. Sasha thinks that the original painting, Echo, doesn't exist anymore. Sasha thinks that it's not Echo anymore, which is exhibited in the museums, but another painting. Alex thinks that the original painting, Echo, still exists. Um, Alex thinks that although the painting has changed, it is still the same Echo that is exhibited in the museums. Who do you agree with more, Sasha or Alex? And the participants had to choose an answer on liquor state, uh, liquor scale from one to seven. We can counterbalance the order. So one is, I totally agree with Sasha and don't agree at all with Alex. Two, I agree much more with Sasha than with Alex. Three, I agree a little bit more with Sasha than with Alex. Four, I agree equally with Sasha and with Alex. Four, I agree a little bit more with Alex than with Sasha. Six, I agree much more with, Sa uh, with Alex than with Sasha. And uh, seven, I totally agree with Sasha and don't agree at all with Alex. Now let us look at the other versions. So, Let's start with vignettes describing a painting. Uh, they all start with the same introduction. So imagine that a contemporary painter creates a new picture echo. The painting is regularly shown to the public during exhibitions and thus becomes quite well known, especially for its very particular colors. Then in the condition where the change is introduced by the author, participants read, one night the painter enters the room of the museum where the painting hangs, and completely changes the colors of his painting. But on leaving the museum, he suddenly dies of a heart attack. While in the other condition where the change happens by external circumstances, which do not depend on creator's will, they read, uh, some time after the death of the painter, a gas leak occurs in the room of the museum where the painting hangs. The gas leak causes a chemical reaction that completely changes the color of the painting. Now, for both conditions, they read, next day, the director of the museum finds out what happened and decides to leave the painting on display. And for the higher value condition, everyone agrees that the painting, that the picture after the gas leak or the ch painter's changes is much more beautiful. Each time the painting is exhibited in a museum, it is a public success. While on the lower aesthetic value condition, Everyone agrees that the picture after the gas leak or the painter's changes is much less beautiful. Each time the painting is exhibited in a mu museum, it is a public failure. And here are the vignettes for musical work. So first, all participants read the same introduction. Imagine that a contemporary musician composes a new piece explosion for a brand new electronic instrument. The instrument is inspired by violin, but has a very different sound. The piece is regularly performed at concerts and thus becomes quite well known, especially for its very particular sound. Now, when the change is introduced by the author, they read, however, a few years after the composer's death, we discovered that the composer left a will in which he asked that his piece would be played on the violin and prohibited to play his piece with the electronic instrument. A large number of violinists, violinists begin to play the composer's piece in their concerts, and from that moment, the piece is only played on the violin. While on the other condition changed by external circumstances, however, a few years after the composer's death, the company that made his new instrument goes bankrupt and stops making them. It becomes impossible to find an instrument in good condition to play the composer's piece. A violinist then has the idea of playing the piece on the violin. Other violinists start imitating her and begin to play the composer's piece only on the violin during their concerts. The sound of the piece is thus completely changed. And uh, 
on the higher aesthetic value condition. Everyone agrees that the piece played on the violin after the discovery of the composer's will or the end of the production of the electronic instrument is much more beautiful. Each time the piece is performed in a concert hall, it is a public success. While on the lower aesthetic value condition, we read, everyone agrees that the piece played on the violin after the discovery of the composer's will or the end of the production of the electronic instrument is much less beautiful. Every time the piece is performed in a concert hall, it is a public failure. So here is the study design. Uh, so value, either positive or negative, and source, uh, either outer or external, uh, where between participants factors and work, either painting of music uh, was a within participant factor. And we recruited 292 participants at INSEAD Sorbonne Université Behavioral Lab in Paris. After excluding participants who failed the attention check and the comprehension check, we were left with 198 participants. And we had two pre-registered hypotheses. One, that positive changes in aesthetic value will be associated with higher ratings of continuity of identity than negative changes. So this hypothesis is based on, on the Phineas gauge effect. And second, that second hypothesis is that ratings of continuity of identity will be uh, higher for musical works than for paintings. So we hypothesize that musical work identity is more resilient to changes. And here are the results represented visually. So you see the source of the change of uh, X axis, uh, where A stands for the outer and W stands for external world changes. And uh, mean ratings of identity on Y axis, M stands for music and P for, uh, for painting. So we run ANOVA to analyze the impact of the three factors. And what we found that there was a main effect of work and interaction between work and source, but no main effect of source and no, main, no, no effect of value. So the main uh, result is this, uh, that we found absolutely no effect of the aesthetic value on ratings of identity. And uh, well, less important probably results were that uh, there was uh, the effect of work on participants' ratings, but it was present only when the participants were uh, presented with the story in which uh, the change uh, had been made by the works author. And no such difference between paintings and musical works was found uh, when the change was made independently of the works author, where, where the change happened, uh, was caused by external circumstances. And for musical works, uh, our participants were more likely to think that the original work has been replaced by a new work when the change was made independently from the work author. So no such difference due to the source on the painting condition. So these results have two implications for the ontology of art. One is that it seems that the identity of musical works is more resistant to changes made by the authors than the identity of paintings. And this is probably, this probably could be explained uh, if we remember again, the Goodman's distinction between allographic and autographic artworks. And uh, we are probably used to think about multiple different instances of a musical work. Uh, this is easier to imagine than, uh, than, than multiple different instances of paintings. And the second um, thing is flexibility of musical works. So the change, if it's being brought about by the composer, is more likely to be seen um, as resulting in continuity of identity. And the, the same change caused by the external circumstances, by the material infrastructure, as in our stories or in the musical world, is more likely to be found to result in, in the original work being replaced by a new work. So the ratings tend to, uh, yeah, tend to be more about two, two, two works. Uh, 
which means that when composers modify their works, they are changing the same works rather than composing new works. And if the change is not made by the works composer, if it's uh, caused by external circumstances, then the work after changes is more likely to be seen as distinct work. So this supports uh, Friedel's hypothesis I mentioned uh, before. So only the original creator can change a musical work. If something happens outside of the, of the original creator's will, it is more likely to be seen as a distinct a new work. And we will now move to the last part of the presentation. I will go back to the main topic, the, the effect of aesthetic value. And uh, well, I will discuss the possible interpretations of, uh, about what happened here. So why didn't we observe any effect of aesthetic value? So we see three possible interpretations of our results. Um, first, it could be the case that the Phineas gauge effect does not extend to aesthetic value. So it is difficult to imagine that beauty might be more essential for another type of objects than artworks, because we make uh, works of art for aesthetic experiences. But yet it might be that we don't think about artworks as essentially aesthetically valuable. There might be another processes guiding our intuitions about the identity of artworks. For example, it could be their moral value or material identity or the relation with the author. So in that case, psychological essentialism does not extend to aesthetic value. And at first glance, our initial results point in this direction. However, it also might be that something went wrong methodologically. So first, it is possible that our phrasing of the vignettes was not very intuitive. And second, it is possible that there was a problem with the reliability of aesthetic testimony and verbal descriptions of artworks. So, well, finally, if neither of these possibilities is true, we should run another story to compare the effects of moral and aesthetic value and judgments of identity. But let us begin with the first, uh, with the first possible explanation. So since artworks are more similar to the kinds of objects in the Frida studies, institutional objects, um, than to human beings, it might be useful to stay as close to the way uh, the Freitas with colleagues uh, formulated scenarios in, the, in their studies. And they actually used a slightly different approach. Uh, the entities were described as consisting of parts, some good, some bad, uh, and then, then after the change, they are mostly good or mostly bad. For instance, here is the vignette about a country, and they write, Belt Shore is a small country. In the majority of its regions, the local government intentionally teaches people to express their opinions freely in public, while in some other regions, the local government intentionally teaches people to discriminate against one another for being different. Over the years, some regions of Bell Shore changed their policies. Now, after these changes in the majority of regions, the local government intentionally teaches people to discriminate against one another for being different. So it might indeed be a more intuitive way to describe what happens to a work of art. And we created uh, a similar vignette about a painting as similar to the Freita studies as, as, as we could. So it looks, it could look like this. So Echo is a painting created by an artist a few years ago. The painting is made by a large number of characters. The majority of these characters are painted with acrylic paint in a very banal way, which leaves people completely indifferent. But some characters are on the contrary painted with oil in a very original way, which moves people. One night, a gas leak occurs in the room of the museum where the painting hangs. The gas leak causes a chemical reaction that destroys the part of the painting made with acrylic paint. Now, the painting only contains the characters painted in oil in a very original way, which moves people. Now, the second possible problem with our vignettes. So many of our participants commented on the study by saying that they would like to see actual uh, work and evaluate the aesthetic change by themselves before answering the questions. Uh, 
And some, some of them explicitly commented that beauty is subjective. I cannot trust what others are saying about the aesthetic value. I have to see it with my own eyes or to hear it with my own ears. So this might be an important difference between moral and aesthetic value. It is quite easy to rely on moral testimony about moral qualities compared to aesthetic qualities. And well, after all, it might sound odd where to say that a musical work is beautiful, but I never heard it. Or this painting is very beautiful, it is moving, but I never seen it with my own eyes. So Jim Sandu ran a study to empirically test the hypothesis that people are less people tend to trust less uh, testimony about the aesthetic uh, value compared to uh, testimony about formal or descriptive properties of artworks. So in this study, he asked uh, the participants about permissibility and legitimacy of reliance on the aesthetic testimony. So in permissibility condition, he asked, is it permissible to adopt the view that a particular painting is beautiful or is ugly or is large? or cost uh, 40 million to create because an expert or a friend or first-hand experience tells you that the painting is beautiful or is ugly or is large or cost 40 mil million to create. Well, and, and the same uh, about legitimacy. So the results have shown that uh, in the testimonial cases, um, forming an opinion is considered to be less permissible and less legitimate in aesthetic cases. That is, uh, well, such as judgments on, on beauty and on ugliness. If we compare them to non-aesthetic cases, such as size and cost. So it seems that people tend to think that it is not permissible to form aesthetic beliefs based on aesthetic testimony. And if people don't believe that it is permissible to form beliefs based on uh, aesthetic value, uh, on the aesthetic testimony, this might be a problem with our study design and participants might not form their opinion about the aesthetic value based on descriptions. So another idea is to run a follow-up study with visual and acoustic stimuli. And we have been thinking about the stimuli we could use, uh, we, could add, yeah, we could add to text vignettes and we created a few excerpts to illustrate, well, uh, how a piece of music how, how a piece of music could be aesthetically destroyed. So I will show you two examples. First, I will show you uh, an original excerpt from uh, Fête de Belles uh, which is written for an electronic instrument as in our vignettes. And then we will see uh, two ways it can be destroyed. Just let me know if you hear the sound. Now, let's hear the first way to destroy this excerpt. And the second way. So we use the program called Phase Vocoder to, uh, yeah, to, to modify these pieces and we will, and we will experiment uh, how to create a good acoustic stimuli. So, okay, sorry. So yeah, here, here is a new vignette, how it would like with uh, acoustic stimuli. Uh, and we would compare these vignettes with the purely textual vignettes. So participants would read that a few years ago, a musician composed a piece called Explosion for a brand new electronic instrument. 
and they will would have a possibility to listen to an excerpt of it. And so on. And then the story continues. Uh, shortly after the composer's death, all copies of this new electronic instrument broke down. It therefore became simply impossible to find an instrument in good condition to play the composer's piece. The company that made this new instrument therefore decided to build a new model. It is this new model of instrument that is now used each time when the piece is played. Here is an excerpt of how the piece sounds now. That would be a second follow-up study. And the last one, finally, a uh, third follow-up study. So if the earlier mentioned two follow-up studies bring the same results as the initial study I presented earlier, then it could be the case that Feynman's gauge effect uh, does not extend to a static value. And it might be that our intuitions about the essence of artworks uh, are more dependent on ethical considerations. So we know from former studies that uh, one aspect of psychological essentialism about artworks is belief in contagion or a belief that through physical contact with the creator, artworks can be contaminated with uh, their essence. So more broadly, that artworks embody the essence of people who created them. And research on intuitions about visual artworks show that people uh, see original artworks as more valuable than identical duplicates. Um, and we know that uh, the physical contact with the uh, artist is seen as possibly contaminating the object with the creator's essence. And even musical works um, can also be uh, perceived to be contaminated with the creator's uh, essence. So here is one study uh, which shows that valuation of musical works depends on composer's morality. Even if in this situation there was no physical contact with the musical work and uh, it wouldn't have been uh, physically contaminated by, by physical contact. So we have a good reason to think that moral considerations are at least not irrelevant for our intuitions about artworks and they might even override aesthetic considerations. So the third follow-up study, uh, we would aim to directly compare moral and aesthetic value uh, and to investigate which of them matters more for our judgments of identity. And uh, the vignettes for such study uh, might look like this one. So Echo is a painting created by an artist a few years ago. The painting is made of a large number of characters. The majority of these characters are painted with acrylic paint in a racist and offensive way. This is the moral condition, while in the aesthetic condition, they, they would read in a very banal way, which leaves people completely indifferent. But some characters are on the contrary painted with oil in the moral condition, in a respectful and benevolent way, and the aesthetic condition in a very original way, which moves people. One night, a gas leak occurs in the room of the museum where the painting hangs. The gas leak causes a chemical reaction that destroys a part of the painting made with acrylic paint. Now, the painting only contains the characters painted in oil in a respectful or benevolent way, or in the aesthetic condition in a very original way, which moves people. So that is that's the plan for, for the third follow-up study to compare aesthetic and moral value. And uh, yes, so these were three ideas for future studies and maybe maybe you will have more. And I will just quickly present the conclusions. So the initial study has shown that changes in aesthetic value have no influence on judgments of the identity of artworks. And the results of the study are in stark contrast to the literature on the effect of goodness on personal or institutional identity. At uh, the first glance, Feynman's gauge effect does not extend to aesthetic value, but this might be due to methodological problems. So either we use the wrong type of vignettes or the folk may refuse to, to form aesthetic beliefs based on aesthetic testimony. Uh, 
So more studies are needed with different types of vignettes and visual and oral stimuli. And yeah, so this is very much work in progress uh, as, as you see, and I would be very happy to hear your thoughts and suggestions about this. Thank you.